Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice weekend. Um, you survived a storm, uh, all right. I think uh, Yasmin, Connie, and I had a quite a frantic uh, Friday um, figuring out how we should do that. I think I really appreciate what Connie and Yasmin did on Friday to kind of keep the seminars running. I appreciate everyone who tried to make an effort and um, help both of them kind of maneuvering this really difficult situation. I think I'm uh, I really. I think Yasmin and Connie both said like, please tell the students uh, how much they appreciate. It. I think it's really, really hard uh, if you're just like you're leading a seminar and you're in a Zoom room and nobody has their camera on and nobody turns to you. It's so frustrating and so, I don't know, anxiety provoking. So uh, a real heartfelt thank you for uh, to everyone who kind of actively participated and tried to make the best out of a good situation. I got some kind of weird advice um, about uh, attendance for those if you're a tier four uh, visa student, I think attendance is really important um it's basically it seems like it will just not count that day um, but if you have any other specific questions please contact the visa team that's what i got from uh the higher ops it was very ambivalent it's just like oh they will treat it as if it's like i don't know attendance was not recorded or something attendance monitoring was off i'm not quite sure what that means if you have any questions about that uh and you're a tier four visa student please contact the visa team and they will answer that okay then let me um switch to my uh, presentation i think can we use this yes okay um we talk about today about social explanation attributions. One of the most, for a really long time, probably the most dominating idea within social psychology and then spread out to basically, as I will show you today, trying to explain everything from depression to emotion to conspiracy theories. It was like the key for like the key dominating approach on understanding human behavior for a while in psychology and really left its mark with some really interesting phenomenon on social psychology as well and we will talk about this today um i just want to kind of allude you a little bit to what is next right and um, so we're kind of like transitioning to taking uh, uh or like to zeroing in on the coursework right i think last week and a week before the exercises we did in the seminars really uh important exercises to better get a feeling for how to write your um uh, your coursework, your reports, right? Um, we are doing these not only to kind of try to get you uh, occupied with something in the seminars or to better understand the content, but also to prepare you uh, for this uh, for this coursework. So this week, what we are uh, doing is to kind of getting to know the marking criteria. How will we mark? How will you get your feedback? How do we assess what kind of mark you will have, right? And so I think it's really important to kind of understand that and thereby you can basically, uh, before you submit it, test yourself. You you did it in the last uh, weeks a little bit where you had to kind of identify relevant and irrelevant content within um, these um uh, irrelevant and irrelevant content within paragraphs, had to write applications, you got feedback on these applications, and I think we will continue with that, that's the thing that most students struggle with. Um, but we will also show you uh, three different exams from last year, um, and then you are asked to mark them. So this will uh, be part of our seminar on Friday, uh, on top of the usual stuff, right? And then next week we will have a double session. You don't have to come to the double session because obviously it will be recorded, but we will have one session where we will talk about um, the um, attitudes. This is our topic for week five, one of the most important topics. Well, I say that every time, but all of these topics are super important, but just like attitudes, yes, permeates everything, um, as does attributions. Uh, I'm not sure if we talk about anything that's kind of irrelevant, hopefully not. Um, I'm trying to keep the content as relevant as possible. Thereafter, instead of the office hour, we will have a coursework session. I will record that. Um, and then we will talk about the coursework. I will explain to you um, what normally goes wrong and how to avoid that, how to approach it, how we mark it, all of these things that will be recorded and will be there. At the end of the week, we will re um, release the scenarios and problems that you can then start working on. Okay, so we're building up that you have a good understanding what to do, and you have then the first part of the content of the module in order to write these things. Okay, so next week, if you need to book the time, I know you have the time in your um, uh, 
uh, in your schedule, uh, in your university schedule, then you uh, book it in coursework 1pm. Thereafter, I think I'll try to keep it um, as close as I can to 30 minutes. Um, last year, they had students had to write two pieces of coursework, um, well, two reports with a thousand words. The good thing about it, it was an absolute nightmare for me. The good thing about it was basically that all students wrote in the first half one piece of coursework, and then I could pay, uh, give them feedback on that. Um, a lot of students did very pure, poorly. Um, I think uh, it's quite a transition into term two. You have a little bit more experience, um, but I will use the uh, coursework from last year as the examples to show you these are the things students often get wrong. This is uh, where things go wrong, and I hopefully this is kind of like a, a, a good preparation then for your coursework. Um, I think there's see something in a chat. Is there a question about this? Yes, the coursework session will be recorded. Um, thank you for that question. Okay. Um, this is uh, just if you're interested in this is the coursework question we will be working on. Um, on this is like an example, the most popular question from the first assignment last year. I think Yasmin and I remember it fondly because we had to mark it about 200 times. We will on Friday, you can use this, like we will see student answers, how they answered that, and some essays that did really well, some essays that didn't do so well, and some essays that did really poorly. And here you can, if you want to test yourself, if you want to know, like, how would I have performed if that, that, this is about one content, obviously, person perception that you already did, you can practice that you can write an outline, you can see if you have all the important points that you need to have. I just want to put that up there. So you're kind of, I think, uh, Yasmin and uh, uh, Connie and I received some question about practice questions and all of these things. So here you can practice Practice with that question. The face look question was another question um, that we uh, gave last year as the first course, uh, coursework. So you can test yourself there as well. Okay. So this is basically when I introduced in the first week, the idea of like, okay, explanations, social explanations, why are they so important? I used this idea of, okay, how do people explain what happened to Sarah Everhart in their course, right? And it was like this one thing where it's like, people really um, uh, um, emotionally reacted to that. And there was kind of like, okay, it sounds like the police commissioner is blaming uh, Sarah Everhart for, hey, uh, uh, why don't you take better care, all right? Um, why don't you, why are you walking alone on a street at night? How dare you, right? And I think they need to be street wise, right? It's like a coded language where it's like, okay, if it's dark and you're a woman, you should not be outside. Obviously, people were outraged about that. I mean, it's a completely tone deaf. It's also it's like a, a abstruse uh, suggestion, but that's often something as a, 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 a headline below highlights. This is a thing that happens, right? There seems to be one thing that's really key in our discourse about things. It's like, if we're trying to understand, okay, um, what happened in a situation, one of the driving forces is who has responsibility, who should we blame, who should make up for it, who should get the suffering, right, uh, the punishment. So there's often kind of this element, but this is like, just to highlight, this is just one of the things, right? Um, here's one another thing where it's like, let's say you would kind of perceive uh, these two people, and you would just see this picture, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, right? I googled it, it was about, I think, stealing, right? And it might be that you kind of see and you're just like, oh, there's this guy, he steals uh, the wallet from the girl. It could also be that he's the um, uh, kind of like the husband or the boyfriend who just drops it back, but that's not suddenly something we assume, right? So we are trying to figure out, and then we think about, okay, what do we think about this guy? If we have to interact with him, we see him doing this. Um, is he a bad person? Are the circumstances driving him to these decisions? Why is she so kind of, I don't know, uh, nonchalant about this? So we are trying to make sense. We observe others in certain situations and try to make sense. We're trying to understand what caused the behavior I see in them or around them, right? We want to understand why people behave the way they behave, especially if they do something of some kind of significance, like stealing or helping or something like that, okay? Uh, remember that we are often like trying to figure out who people are truly are, if they're on our team or not team and so forth. Uh, one thing that I just like, I think I teased it a little bit in my emails that one of the most influential programs, right, on uh, kind of 
in psychology period in psychology probably ever is um uh, uh carol dweck's uh, research line on the uh, incremental and entity mindset this is how it used to be before she uh, called before she wrote her book and they thought these are two academic academic terms and you need something more like a growth mindset and fixed mindset um but she started and we come back to this she started basically with this question of how people explain their own behavior and especially if people fail Right. So it's like there's something really interesting about, oh, if things go wrong, how do I explain it? Right. If I make a mistake, how do I explain it? And that's kind of led her then eventually to her mindset theory. And I will walk you through it. And there are some really interesting lessons to be learned for us. But it's just really important that if you end psychology as an undergrad, you need to know Carol Dweck. And I can't imagine that indirectly or directly any of you have not made contact with the theory, right? Nothing has permeated um, our kind of um, educational system as much as the ideas by Carol Dweck. On, and so I think it's just like really important. It's also one of the best uh, research programs out there. Um, so we come back to that when we talk about kind of explaining our own behavior. So we will start with kind of social attributions and or uh, attributions and social explanation in general. OK, just to give you a flavor, a little bit of history on this topic and why do we care about this? Um, we will uh, start by then looking at explaining our own behavior and then we'll bring this to the achievement context. OK, so this is where Carol Dweck is at home, where it's kind of like uh, talking about achievement and learning. Um, we will talk a little bit about depression. We will talk about emotions and how explanations um, kind of figure into that. And then I think or not, I think these are the, we have three shorter videos online so once we kind of understand how we explain our own behaviors we are explaining the behaviors of others especially the fundamental attribution error and kind of his history will be in chapter four we will use the fundamental attribution error to kind of look how social explanations differ across cultures um, and so this was one, I think, Marcus and Kitayama, when they published their 1991 article, one of the most influential article in psychology um, about culture and the self is like, oh, look, the fundamental attribution error, which we think is fundamental to every human, is actually not that fundamental because in other cultures it doesn't exist. And so this kind of gives us the idea, OK, whenever we look at these phenomena, especially in social psychology, we have to think about culture. And we will talk a little bit about attributions and concepts conspiracy theories, right? Why do some people kind of when they see something like coronavirus uh, or vaccination think about, um, I don't know, 5G uh, conspiracy theories or something, right? This often is very foreign to us, but how can we kind of make sense out of that? Who are the people who do that and what drives their behavior? So we will have that in the last bit. Okay, um, I want to start with a short video. OK, I think I hope this works uh, and kind of give you a feeling for how not only did it start in social psychology, social explanations, but um, OK, <laughs> um, but also like how like to give you a feel for how fundamental it is that we are trying to figure out what other like what are the motives, what are the factors that drive uh, other people's behavior. So I will show you um, a little, I don't know, video clip. Well, it is a video clip, an animation from 1944 that people, um, these researchers, Hyder and Simmel, showed their participants, OK? And I'll let me, and they basically ask uh, them, the participants, just freely to describe what is happening in this video. Most of you have, might have um, already um, seen this or not. It's a little bit like, remember, this is like uh, 80 years ago, so it's not the greatest quality. But here you see this square, uh, here's square, and there's a um, triangle.
All right, Uppsala. So what happened if um, Uppsala, when um, how did someone ask a participants to explain it? I think you saw the video and a lot of them said like, oh, there's the big kind of the triangle that's a little bit of a bully and there are these two friends, maybe they're a couple and they come in and then there's this house and that seems like the big guy who's a little bit mean, he and so forth, uh, he, the, he wants to defend it or they want to go in. So they make up these stories and then everything like at the end, they leave him and he feels bad about it and he gets really angry angry and he destroys his house or something along those lines. I think it's inevitable if you see that. I think if you experience that, that you will not come up with explanations, that you don't form kind of like a social narratives about these triangles and uh, one, these two triangles and one circle and one square hopping around, right? In this very rudimentary um, uh, 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 animation. And this is the key to trying to kind of, okay, even if we remove everything, there's no soul, there's not even humans in there. We can't help but kind of trying to make sense out of these patterns um, by attributing uh, human-like minds to others, right? Even if it's a triangle, even if it's a circle, we come back to this a little bit when we talk about at the end about conspiracy theories, right? Where similar things might go on, where we see random patterns and some people then have the tendency to attribute meaning to random patterns and thereby um, form these theories. But it's like, this is the key idea, right? Of social explanations. We are trying to understand finding explanations of what is happening here and then make sense of it. And probably because we want to prepare, we want to predict and control the behaviors of others. So here you see Fritz Heider. He's um, one of the early founding fathers of social psychology. He's very influential in psychology as well in general. And he said like, oh, we want to, like, I think we talked about this in the previous um, lectures as well. We have to think about people as kind of naive psychologists, right? They observe something and then they are trying to make sense of it, right? So they're looking, it's like, oh, there's like a person who's um, doing this. Why is she doing that? What are the causes? What are driving her? Uh, what does that tell me about her? And he said, okay, so they're like, we're trying to understand the causes. And one of the things that I mentioned, he was really interested in, it's like, okay, what we're trying to do is identify kind of stable factors within another person. Okay, I want to know why she's doing it and what I'm uh, 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 kind of predisp uh, my predisposition is to find something that is kind of stable in her. And why do I do this? Because I have this desire for, con for control and prediction. I want to feel right that, oh, if I understand her behavior as, for instance, she's a, a neurotic type. Okay. Oh, this is her personality. She's not a good person. That is why she did that. Right. Then I have a feeling of control and predictability. So he thought like, OK, the way people explain these um, is to kind of look at stable factors and they uh, because they long for this understanding of control and prediction. Uh -huh. Um, and then he was these other ones like, okay, what are they looking for? Looking there for if we explain the behaviors of others, if we explain the behaviors of ourselves, he was more interested of others. There's this other dimension for internal versus external, right? Is it the person or the situation, right? Um, I think in a video of his video, there's like, there's not much as a situation, but you can think about um, other places where it's like, okay, how much does the situation influence his or her behavior and how much it does is it something within that person right and that was kind of like the beginning with these stable versus instable factors with internal versus external and we we're starting to kind of and this was like in the 60s 70s 80s people um built these uh, dimensions of explanations to better understand how or systematize how people make these decisions right um so one of the most influential kind of ideas came from uh martin seligman's uh, and we talk about this in this next chapter a little bit more about um, learned helplessness, right? He did actually research on um, dogs and he wanted to see why have do some dogs kind of respond with a depression-like um, uh, um, uh, response to a certain set of 
uh, unpleasant events and others not. What does the differentiate one dogs from the others? And there's this kind of learned helplessness that emerged from that. Um, we will talk about emotions, right? You can see the idea from attribution uh, theory very on, where it's like the way you explain something, and here's Schachter and Singer, and we come back to that, one of the most influential um, uh, social psychological uh, experiments of emotions, right? The way we make sense of it dominates our emotions, right? And then, I mean, you can say at some point at the kind of height of uh, personal like attribution theory, right? We, we met Walter Michel and he, Walter Michel, you probably, I think you have personality, you probably talked about it in a first or second lecture, right? He basically in the 60s and 70s said like, there is no such thing as personality. This is just a fundamental misattribution error. People think if they explain the behavior, they think of something um, that is internally controlled, but this is just wrong, right? So he had this like this most uh, radical, I think nobody would that like endorse that statement um, anymore. But he said like, oh, maybe if I look at all the evidence, I can't see anything that there is personality, but I see researchers who look for internal causes. And this is just because they have this fundamental misattribution error, which we come in chapter four. So you say the wide uh, influence on many, many areas uh, applied, such as clinical, but also kind of uh, fu uh, fundamental signs are trying to use attributions, explanations of our own behavior and others to understand why people behave and feel and um, think in a certain way. Um, so we will start by talking a little bit about how we explain our own behavior. And this is the main uh, remainder of this lecture where we talk about how do people explain their own behavior and the consequences of that. And then we look at uh, an additional ones about how people explain the behaviors of others. Okay, obviously important for social psychology, which once we have learned these systems, you will see um, uh, how easy they can be applied. And then we talk about in the last two additional videos about how people use that to like in different um, societies, but also how people make sense of what's going on within them in society. And especially if they use kind of conspiracy theories in order to make sense of the world. So this is basically the kind of introduction and intuition about uh, the topic here. Okay, so let's drill a little bit deeper and trying to think what are the dimensions people are using when they explain events? How can we find systematics, right? If I ask just you, okay, oh, you failed at something, why is this the case, right? There's so many answers you can give, so many different ones. How can I, as a scientist, put some kind of structure on them, okay? So if you think, oh, it's just like, this is like, let's say you failed, like, let's say it's like, um, I don't know, two months uh, uh, in the future, you just get your PS 2006 um, exam, like if not exam, coursework back and you get like a 58, okay? You're just like, ugh, okay, 58. How would you explain that to yourself, right? And so what do you think it is that caused that, right? So what researchers early on did is that they looked at people with like significant events in people's um, life. They looked at significant types of behavior and then asked people, how do you explain that, right? And we met already some of these kind of um, uh, uh, dimensions, but I just want to kind of reiterate them here. One of the most important ones is the locus of control, right? Is it internal or external? Is it something within you or is it something outside you? Is it something within the other person or outside the other person, right? Another one, so, um, and I'll give some examples in a second. Um, the other one uh, that is really important is something stable or unstable, right? So it could be internal stable, it could be internal unstable, external uh, stable and unstable. And then a third dimension that people were, this is um, research by Weiner um, that was very influential uh, is controllability, oopsala, okay? So whether you have control over it or not, okay? So uh, maybe at the first time you kind of see this and you're like, oh, it all sounds kind of the same. Uh, let's try to figure out why these uh, uh, decisions are interesting and why they make very different predictions about um, how we feel and behave, right? Okay, so let's say the locus is, uh, we're like on the left side here, we have an internal locus of control and we look something at controllable. 
Okay, so let's say I ask you, mm, why did you fail in your uh, exam? Why did you get a 58? I think it's kind of like all of you can do better than a 58. Uh, if you put in the effort, and it's like, oh, okay, there's something controllable and stable as your answer, right? For instance, long term effort versus something control uncontrollable and stable aptitude. I'm just not smart enough, right? Um, or you could just like, so it would be, oh, I've never went to uh, the lectures, never listened to the lectures, never watched the additional videos. Uh, so that would be a long term effort, um, something stable. You just didn't do anything for three months. And so this explains it. Uh, or you feel like you're not smart enough, right? Um, so this is uncontrollable. Um, you can easily see, and we come back to this in a second, but you can easily see if you emotionally, how does like these two different explanations really impact your self-esteem and impact how you think about your like like how you feel about it right um you can think about something unstable um and uh, internal right you can think like okay um maybe I, I lack this one skill i lack this one knowledge oh if only i have would have known it's hard think, that i need to go to the lectures in order to do well on my coursework if i would have known that okay everything would have been uh, good there's some temp Temporary or situational effort, right? If you think about an exam, you might just feel like, oh, I didn't feel quite like it that day, or I couldn't really motivate myself. Um, similar internal and unstable, but uncontrollable. You might be sick. You might have like a, I don't know, uh, an anxiety attack that you feel like you can't control. Um, so there's something internal yet unstable. And um, so these are kind of like the four different ones. And you can then, if people say that, psychologists and uh, clinicians and uh, uh, therapists still do this to this day, they kind of um, put them into what locus of control is. A friend of mine, uh, which like internal or which of these internal, that tells me how she should feel about it and which sol solutions she might use, okay? If you talk about something external, and this is what I want to say, a friend of mine, when she finished psychology, uh, her degree with me, what she did is she started to work as a therapist within an addiction clinic and she's like oh man it's so hard uh, she had to stop it because everyone there had always an external explanation for why they were addicted and why they couldn't help themselves right so um, something external but controllable would be stupid teacher um uh, something external controllable but unstable she's like okay uh <laughs> again stupid teacher uh somebody the teacher did not help me as much they did uh, uh, others that day right and then uncontrollable would be basically psychology is too hard for me an external um uncontrollable unstable which is like i had bad luck was just uh, I like uh, said okay. I only learn half of the content, and the other half was part of it. And hence, okay, was just bad luck. Um, so here you can see basically these different. Um, okay, so somebody I don't know if you just like um, just ask me in a chat if you can stable versus unstable again. So I think the easiest way to think about it is like if you fail in your exam and you think about effort versus intelligence. Right? What is the reason for that? Um, oh no, stable versus unstable. Oh, sorry, this was internal versus external. It was stable versus unstable, right? Um, so something that will always be there, right? So something stable will be just like, I will always be stupid, okay? There's nothing I can do about it, right? Or you'd say like unstable would be something like coronavirus. I couldn't, like online teaching, I, I couldn't take it. Now we are offline, okay, and I'm in person again and things will be fine, right? So often when I meet with students who come to, like as you can do once you finish your exam, get your marks back, talk about feedback, a lot of students say something that is kind of external, unstable. I just had a difficult time at home um, or uh, that time was like too much going on or something like that. That sounds like, oh, now it's all in the past and um, now the situation has changed and things uh, better. I hope this is uh, helpful. If not, um, just uh, put it in the chat again, and we talk about it in the in the office hour. Um, 
So one of the things that's kind of apparent, right? It's like the way you explain behaviors, the way a person explains behaviors will really dominate the emotional responses they have, right? So I think there's a little bit like um, you can, on a, a, a bigger picture, right? You can think a little bit about internal versus external, something that is kind of anger versus control, right? You might be angry at the world that uh, you had bad luck or that your teacher is stupid right? Um, you might be angry at that, or you might be sad because you think you didn't put the, um, uh, you like you don't have it, what it takes to perform well in social psychology, or you might feel like, okay, um, uh, uh, like I didn't, I couldn't motivate myself for two, three months, and that makes you sad. Right. So if you take responsibility, you have an internal uh, um, uh, locus of control, an internal style of attributions, then you will experience more sadness, an external one, you will feel more anger. Right. Um, and so I think this is just for uh, negative things. And we'll look at this in a second. So people kind of show like, OK, depending on how you explain things, you will have the same experience, very different emotional and motivational consequences. Um, one of the things, oh, this is like an in, in experiment by Schachter and Singer, where they try to manipulate that in some sense. And it's like, OK. Um, how does that can we manipulate and show that these external uh, these uh, attribution patterns really um, change the way we think about the same event and here the same event is basically an event where you get injected as one of the participants adrenaline into your blood um, good old 60s I think you could just kind of relatively easily inject participants with a little something so either got that or placebo and so your heart starts racing and then I was like before we start our experiment can you please wait here with these other um, people in that room and so in one like if you're in one condition, there would be a funny person. Here's a clown. I don't think clowns are very funny, but just like let's just assume the, the clown is really funny. So you're sitting in that room, your heart is racing, and there's somebody who is uh, making some jokes, right? Now, what the people thought, like what they basically experienced in this condition is like, oh, okay, my heart races, I see this clown. Oh, he must be really funny. That's why my heart races. And they were extremely, they, they enjoyed this performance by this clown really uh, 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 strongly, right? In the other condition, I saw somebody who's really annoying, right? Like another uh, participant, and they were complaining. There's like, why is it taking so long? Well, I want to see uh, the PI, the principal investigator. I want to see the manager, whatever, right? Right? So there's somebody who's really annoying in this room. Now you kind of look at, okay, there's this annoying person. And so this might, I uh, must cause my internal excitement. So it's anger and people got uh, uh, expressed really strongly the anger, right? So it's basically you have one event, it's like something that is inside you. And then you try to kind of make sense out of it and whatever explanation you find, which is either provided by your learning history or your environment, that then kind of catapults your emotions into actions. Um, so, oh, there's like, here's like one person who run with that really strongly and that's Martin Seligman. He's the founder, among other things, of positive psychology, quite a quirky character. Um, but I think that's uh, for another day. But he had this idea, developed this idea of learned helplessness. So what he did is basically he put little cute dogs like this one into um, a box. In the first box, you can see these metal rods on the floor. In the first one, all of these metal rods were the same. And the dog would lay in this cage. And then um, Seligman would put uh, electricity on these metal rods and they would get shocked. Okay, and whatever they do in that box, um, they could not get out. Okay, so they would be shocked no matter what. So it is basically to kind of simulate what happens to you if you're basically uh, experience failure, hurt, misery without having any control over it. And so the dogs do that. And then, and this is the interesting part, the dogs will be put in one of these cages. And you can see here with these two different sides. Okay, in one of the sides, you can you get shocked, and this is where the dog gets in. They will be put on the side of the uh, shocks. And then they will activate the shock. And if the dog jumps over it, then he's on a safe side. 
So he finds that about 75% of the dogs just kind of go down and don't do anything. They just lay there and do not react. But about 25% of the dogs jump on the other side, okay? So he became really interesting. What is it that some people basically kind of uh, 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 take away that, oh, if bad things happen to me, there's nothing I can do about it. And um, so they don't do anything about it. In others, a smaller percentage with the dogs do not come to the same uh, conclusion. So he kind of wrote his bestseller, Learned Optimism. Uh, in German, the title is Don't Kiss Pessimists. I don't know why this is the case, but just here, it's like, I don't know. It's like, uh, it, but you can see it was like a um, world best selling book translated in many, many uh, 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 um, uh, languages. And here he said, like, oh, the way to happiness, the way to productivity, the way to uh, 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 flourishing is the right way to explain events, okay? That is learned optimism, you, and you can learn it, okay? Um, so what does he think we should do, okay? So what Seligman does, and this is kind of like, here's like Abrahamson, which we met last week, was also a Teasdale, another important person, but they kind of had this, basically it's derived from this idea of learned helplessness as a subcategory of depression. And what they say is like, okay, on the left hand, we have the depressed person, on the right hand, we have this non-depressed, depressed person is happy person and now something bad happens to them okay uh, bad exam um uh, uh whatever like let's just stick with the bad exam okay and what he thinks is that people who are depressed they use internal um uh, uh attributions for failure whereas the happy person uses external uh, the, the depressed person uses something stable, the happy person uses something temporal, and then the uh, uh, unhappy or depressed person uses something global, and the non-depressed person uses something specific. So a key example that would capture all these three emo like, uh, explanations on the left would be, I'm too stupid. Right? So there's like, okay, I'm a stupid person, this internal stable global. It's like whatever I do in all areas of my life, it will impact this, right? And an external temporal specific, which is like, I was just not having a good day, okay? So this is something that happens once that is temporal, it's very specific to that event. And okay, there's nothing to worry about, right? There's nothing wrong with me. I just like, I don't know. It was like, oh, I had bad luck with the teacher or it's like, um, I don't know, like something else uh, that kind of uh, happened that is external temporal specific, right? So here you basically, the internal uh, takes the blame and says like, there's nothing I can do about it. And the external happy person says like, well, not my fault uh, and it won't occur again. And it was very specific to just this one event. I'll be fine in the future. And he says like what happens is basically it flips when good things happen. So now that the, the kind of depressed person says like, well, um, okay, uh, something good happens. This is because oh, I was just lucky and something good happens to the non-depressed people. And she's like, oh, this is because I'm so intelligent. Okay, or I'm so funny or I'm so whatever. Okay, so he thinks the way to kind of basically uh, be happy, be productive to flourish is to um oh okay oh i have this animation in here now this makes more sense okay um so right this kind of flips now um is the key of this idea here that um uh, 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 the uh, for positive events people use uh the internal stable global explanation style in order to feel good about themselves so he basically says like and this is something here's like this idea right that was prevalent at the time as well still is about self-enhancement and he said, oh, the way to remain happy and productive is to use this kind of self-serving bias. Whenever thing, somebody, something bad happens, just blame somebody else. And if something, oh, I, that's not well done here, I have to redo this slide. Uh, so if something good happens, you should think they use the internal stable and global uh, explanation. So just to summarize this again, because the slide is a little bit confusing. So he says that basically what learned happiness is, what learned optimism is, is to use an external temporal specific style to explain something bad and an internal stable and global uh, uh, explanation style to explain something good.
in some sense you can see i always think like when i hear about it thinking, like, this sounds to me like most people and this is really annoying often if you work with somebody like that because whenever something goes wrong it's like what happened it's like oh it's not my fault right um i think you can see and it's like at the same time when he was proposing these ideas people were a little bit like oh that sounds super annoying right um is a person is like they come that you talk to them it's like why why did you come too late oh it was the bus uh, why does nobody like you in your shared flat? Oh, these are all weird people, right? It's like whenever something goes wrong, it's like, okay, they have some somebody else's fault. And you think, well, I don't know, maybe, well, well uh, you think maybe, maybe it's something wrong with them, right? So I think um, there's like the, so, but that was Seligman was pushing it. Um, and this is kind of like at the same time, people like Carol Dweck and uh, Rudder had similar concerns. They felt like, oh, if we think about this in an achievement context, then it also kind of stops the idea of growth, of taking responsibility of your failures in order to grow, right? How can we basically incorporate that? One of the driving kind of ideas be, that is still uh, really prevalent today is this idea, oh, okay, is this idea of internal locus of control. I just wanna give you a little bit of kind of like flavor of how people would um, measure these things um, uh, that we talk thereafter about and kind of ask you one question you can give, on a right, your own answers, right? So let's imagine you're in your second year, term two, just got back social psychology, you felt like you're doing good, you liked the topic, you invested some effort into your coursework, you felt like you got this, you liked the topic and writing the report was even a bit fun, and then you get back your mark into 58. So what's the reason for that, right? Um, so this is something that um, uh, uh, the, they would use in these like if they were trying to study for instance student achievement they would say okay i do not have the ability to i do not have the ability to get better marks for written coursework right the marking was unfair more effort would have gotten me first i might have used the wrong strategies for doing the research and write up my ideas the content of the module wasn't really something i'm interested in i should have copied somebody's previous coursework to get a better mark okay but you can see here, there's like, there's one shift about, okay, uh, accepting blame, and the other one is rejecting blame, right? The marking was unfair, it's not my fault, I did well, versus, okay, I should have gotten more effort into it. Um, but there's also another dimension where it's like, I do not have the ability, it would be, it's my fault, there's something stable. Right, that gives you a flavor of these dimensions. Uh, one of the like of this work, one of the most important ones. I just want to quickly highlight this is the locus of control. So, if you have an internal locus of control, for instance, I have a very strong internal locus of control. I don't like I like cooking more than being cooked for. I like serving more than being served for. I want to be in control and responsible. Uh, but that's just like how I enjoy myself. And this is like people say like, oh, you have a very strong internal locus focus of control, okay? I can usually achieve what I want if I work hard for it. I can learn almost anything if I set my mind on to it. Bad luck has sometimes prevented me from achieving things. It's not something I, for instance, would believe in. Most of, oh, what happens in my career is beyond my control. That's also, so the first two ones would be uh, people who have a strong internal locus of control. And the second one, the second two, like the third and the fourth, are the ones that highlight an external locus of control, okay? Um, but one of the more interesting programs that emerged from this was from Carol Dweck, right? And so she, here's like, I mean, I think I said she penetrated uh, every area of research, um, not a research of our living, right? She has a best-selling book, she has like a chat talks, but she also make a huge impact in uh, many, many schools in education, right? It's not just like the superficial uh, kind of Martin Seligman style of uh, a success where you uh, earn a lot of money and have a best-selling book. No, her research really impacted. So let us kind of look at how she developed this idea for mindsets, okay? And so what Carol was really interesting in the beginning in the uh, 70s, she started as everyone did basically in the 70s, she looked at ex explanations. And what she was really interested in is kind of looking how children cope with failure. So she would basically give these children uh, unsolvable tasks or very difficult tasks, tasks where they're likely to fail or they could, they, they were just um, 
It was impossible to do, get them right, right? And she looked at like, who keeps on going? Who um, uh, drops out? And how do these uh, children explain their behavior? And what she finds is really on that there are these two types of behaviors or these two types of behaviors and these two types of children. So there's this one type of children, um, which she called mastery oriented. Okay, and um, here she sees like all oh, these children, they, something would go wrong. Uh, they couldn't ma like master something. They couldn't solve a task. I was like, oh, this is interesting. This, oh, this is great. Um, it seems like I'm learning something. It seems like I'm doing something wrong here. It seems I need to change my strategy. Um, so they become, with failure, they become more invested in the task. They persisted in doing it and they tried new and different things to solve the problem. And then there's this kind of more helplessness oriented pattern where the children would suddenly start to get kind of nervous. They would feel uh, self-conscious about uh, in front of the experiment that was like oh i'm not sure if i want to do this anymore um i think oh it seems like i'm not smart enough for this task and so forth so these children would kind of stop working on these tasks and they would it would be almost like their own concern would be to explain their behavior in a good way or in a way that makes sense in front of the experimenter it's like oh i'm not feeling quite well i think i'm I don't want to do this anymore. I think I should stop now, et cetera, right? So she identified these two patterns of attributions and to kind of see that there, there's these children who, whenever something goes wrong, they invest more effort, they want to learn, they're task focused. And then there are these other people or these other kids and the same is true for students, the same is true for all types of people who become kind of person focused. And for them, it seems all about saving face. Okay, in front of themselves and others. So she's like, oh, this is interesting. That really explains um, uh, a lot here. But uh, then, so her next question was basically, okay, like why do some of these children have these tasks, right? And here you can kind of think about, okay, she, she gives something like that um, to uh, different children. She's like, oh, here's a task. You can learn something. And here's a task where you perform well. Right, you can think about your own life. Oh, in your third year, how do you choose your electives? Is the main driving idea is like figuring out which are ones are the ones you get easy good marks on, or is it something that's like I don't care about the marks, I only go for those that I'm interested in, those that might help me to learn something more. Right. And when she's like, okay, maybe this is related to how people learn their or explain their behavior. The goals people have might be interested in that. Okay. It might be related to that. So what she finds is basically that is this idea and she develops that with Elliot, uh, Elaine Elliot, but she kind of, uh, uh, she was the main force behind it. It's like these two different types of goals that I have here. Okay. And they're performance goals or learning goals. Performance goals, if you, I want to get a good mark. Okay, classic performance goal with for students. Okay. And she says like, well, here it really matters whether you have high levels of ability or not. So if you're Albert Einstein and you um, go through mathematics, physics at the university level, you will never experience failure. So for her, it's like it's almost like it doesn't really matter that much whether you have a performance goal or a learning goal. If your abilities are high, you still respond in kind of like a master oriented way. Right. So she would say if people have a performance goal and low abilities, then what they will do is they will sacrifice learning and choose moderate, easy tasks. OK, so I just like I take the modules where I know um, I, I might perform well. Right. It's, I, it doesn't matter whether I learned something or not. It doesn't really matter whether I'm interested or not. If things go wrong, they have this kind of learned helplessness response. OK, so they stop trying to figure things out and just thinking about how they can save faith. But then she says, if you have a learning goal, for instance, if your goal is to develop your ability or to understand the topic really well, then it doesn't matter so much whether your confidence is high or low, because what you, you, would, you would choose things that offer the highest um, chance of learning things that you're interested in. And whenever something goes wrong, you will respond with a master oriented pattern. You will say, okay, uh, I want to understand this better. Uh, now there's a problem I can't. This highlights, for instance, that I don't understand a certain aspects of it better. Now I need to find a different strategy. 
Okay, that would be kind of this master oriented uh, approach to understanding it. Um, so here's one study where they kind of looked at this, they manipulated with these children, uh, the perceived the perceived ability, they told them, oh, our pretest shows us that you have high or low ability, right? And then they have this kind of where they highlight a learning goal versus a performance goal. I show you that in a second, okay? How they can do it. And then they wanna see if I give you some really tough problems, how do you respond to that? Um, and so it was a box, the task choice is that basically kind of like the, the box that allows you to display your ability versus choose a box that allows you to develop your skill, skills and become better, right? Use this one box with questions and problems and you can show us how good you are. Use the other one and you can basically uh, learn something, right? And then they all get the same task, of, of course. And then you can see how well do they perform and how do they talk about their problems when they're confronted confronted with them. Um, so here, this is like just the style of, I think, I can't really remember what type of, I think they had to figure out, it's like some kind of hypothesis testing about triangles and um, uh, squares. Um, this is the example they did. This is the example manipulation performance task. In this box, we have problems of different levels. Some are hard, some are easier. If you pick this box, although you won't learn new things, it will really show me what kids can do. And then here's like, you can, you probably, if you choose the learning box, you'll probably make a bunch of mistakes, get a little confused, maybe feel a little bit dumb, but eventually you learn some useful things, right? It's like the, the kind of the distinction between. So what you can see basically in the results is that um, the children in the, um, uh, Yes, so, okay, so they have these kind of like conditions, right? And I think I just want to highlight one thing and I read it out what they, um, what Carol Dwack, because I think I'm mindful of the time, um, what Carol Dwack says, what she observes. Huh? And I think the key point is always what happens, performance goal, and you have low abilities, right? And what you can see is basically with this low, low score here indicates you that basically these children stopped improving and they basically deteriorated, um, uh, their performance deteriorated uh, once something went wrong. Particularly noteworthy is that children, all the children in the performance goal, low perceived ability group attributed failure to uncontrollable causes, non-attributed failure to a lack of effort, a controllable or modifiable factor, right? Of the low ability group who has made attributional statements, half attributed their failures to themselves, um, and so forth. Okay, so she's like, okay, it's interesting what happens if you have uh, lower ability and these performance goals. That basically they all take, um, uh, 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 like, they all explain it in something that doesn't give them any control over changing it. Right? It kind of uh, really shows the importance of the goals people have and how these goals impact the attributional patterns. Okay. Um, so she was uh, uh, done with that. Let's just like this is the verbalization who kind of shows the same thing about how children handle these situations. Um, and it also shows that like the children within these uh, performance goals have much higher um, negative affect, right? The emotional consequences of that. Um, and then she kind of like, and I think, uh, let me just kind of, uh, well, I don't, I don't have to rush about it. She's like, but then she thought like, why is it then some people have learning goals and some people have performance goals? Um, and here the idea is like, okay, what happens is that we have these mindset theories, right? We have these ideas about how intelligence works, how uh, ability works. And based on these ability, like on the theories, we either chose performance or learning goals. And these performance or learning goals then impact how I explain something. Okay, so here it would be like, okay, let's think about this. You have a certain amount of intelligence and you really can't do much about it. And you can always greatly change how intelligent you are, right? So she thought like there's this one, this fixed mindset and then this incremental or growth mindset. Um, so one th of these uh, like a group of people think of us think that intelligence is something we're born with that is fixed. There's nothing you can do. It's somewhat genetic, hardwired in our brain. And other things, it works like a muscle. The more you train it, the better it works. And alongside of these go then these kind of like the uh, uh, 
the effort beliefs that we have either, oh, if I have to invest a lot of effort, that means I'm not very smart. Or if I don't do very well, I have to invest more effort. So here's like really, how do you perceive effort as in something that indicates that you're somewhat insufficient? Or do you see it as something that is needed in order to perform well and to grow? Um, and this is basically when she formulates her mindset theory, okay? Um, and these are these two fixed mindset, growth mindset, and the older articles, it's incremental mindset and entity mindset. Um, but it's basically the idea you have a, like a fixed mindset that you have a certain amount and there's nothing you can do about your intelligence. Um, and then uh, the growth mindset is this uh, metaphor of the muscle, right? Um, and so I think let me kind of skip to that, but the key idea through uh, on a slide, and if you revisit it, is like that this creates basically a meaning making system. If you have these assumptions, then suddenly you uh, this impacts the goals you set, and it impacts how you explain things that happen to you, and thereby it impacts your behavior. So it's not the attributions. The attributions are consequences, and the goals are consequences of the beliefs you have about intelligence. Okay. Um, so this kind of creates this mindset. Um, the other thing about mindset theory that's really important to keep in mind is that basically it says like, okay, um, this is really important if things go wrong, okay? It's not so much that the mindset theory, if things go smoothly, it doesn't really matter what the mindset you have. Okay, if you think, oh, there's an indicator that it, I invested enough effort, so you have an incremental or growth mindset, great. If it's just like, oh, this shows that I'm smart enough, which is like a, a fixed mindset, right? It doesn't matter. But if things get hard, then it really, the mindset really separates this. And this is the transition into high school. There's a famous study here where you can see basically students with an incremental and an entity mindset, uh, uh, a growth and a fixed mindset in uh, our most uh, uh, use that language now, you can see that they're basically the same when they enter with their math craze in the fall of the seventh grade. But now things get more complicated and you can see that those with an incremental mindset respond positively to it, right? They get better and better over the years, whereas those with an uh, entity mindset, they do not progress, right? Um, so it is basically the mindset theory predicts that this really matters when things become difficult and when things are setbacks. Um, let me, I mean, there's like, it's insane how well studied this is. Let me highlight one study here. This is a study with 170,000 participants in uh, Chile. Uh, and they find basically that your achievement test scores, your test scores correlate to point, uh, four, uh, 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 0.34 um, with your achievements, okay? With your mindset, sorry. Um, and so, um, and here again, they find the strongest correlation is for those children who have, were at greater risk of low performance, those facing, for instance, socioeconomic disadvantages, right? The more difficult your situation is, the more it matters how you think about your intelligence and how you then respond to the inevitable problems that you will face, okay? This is another study, and I'll leave it with that, where they basically, around 74 countries in the world, they tested this with a PISA. Most of you might have participated at least once in your life in PISA, um, this kind of like international assessment of basically how education works uh, all around the world. And they find in 72 out of 74 uh, um, uh, countries positive correlations between the mindset and the achievements, okay? Um, so and this is the last okay well yeah this is the last slide and i'll just leave it with that this is the idea how it works and then i end this and it's just to say basically my the, the last point i want to make is that it's important to remember that attributions are a consequence of the beliefs and goals we have okay there are symptoms not causes so if you have a fixed mindset what happens is that once you encounter problems you have negative effort beliefs you set yourself performance avoidant goals and you have these helpless responses these attributions and that leads to negative causes right and the same thing is like uh, so courage record is like if you want to change a student's performance do not start with attributions right in stark contrast to what the like seligman says right she says 
because attributions are symptoms, not consequences, right? And so this is like the big difference between Seligman and Carol Dwack. And I think if you, uh, you have um, clinical introduction to clinical psychology, you can see people are not interested in the learned helplessness theory of depression anymore because they see learned helplessness, this kind of pattern of explanation now as a symptom, not a cause for depression, okay? And let me end this here. Um, and then I, yes, and um, yep, yeah, I'm here for any questions you have. Sorry that it took me uh, almost the whole hour. <laughs>